Well, good evening and a very warm welcome to Grace Baptist Church in Perth this Sunday evening. Thank you for joining with us. If you're a regular, uh, thank you. If you've just stumbled over this broadcast, again, we just pray that the Lord will bless you and that you will stay to the end of the broadcast and worship with us and that he will edify you and build you up over the next 45 minutes or so. Um, we have a, a few announcements as we had this morning. They're basically the same. Uh, Tuesday, this Tuesday coming at 7 o'clock, we will continue on in our Christianity Explored and we will be doing that over Zoom. 7 o'clock. Everybody who's joined in has been greatly blessed and I think it has been a um, something that we've all enjoyed as well and also getting to know other people and fellowshipping with other people as we did it. We do hope to do this again. Hopefully not over Zoom. Hopefully it will be physically. We'll be able to meet somewhere and be able to do that in the near future. But we've been blessed um, over this time of lockdown with Christianity Explored. So seven o'clock on Tuesday evening. The next night, Wednesday, at seven o'clock again and again over Zoom. The ladies will be meeting for their virtual cafe and their book club and continuing on in their uh, study of biblical womanhood. And again, I, I do believe that the ladies have been blessed as they've been joining in and discussing uh, this very important subject. Then the next evening, Thursday evening at half past six, uh, half past six on Thursday is our time of prayer and time of Bible study. And again, that will be over Zoom. And again, we will be continuing to look at um, prayer, sorry, fasting and the believer, fasting and the believer. And that is on Thursday evening at half past six and once more over Zoom. And as I said, we hope to meet on the 16th of August, uh, physically again as a congregation. Uh, and we really do covet your prayers. Um, uh, there'll be a lot of hard work needed to do and, and other churches have, have, are, are doing that at this particular moment. So it's not impossible, but we are a small band of believers. We're an aging band of believers. Um, so it may be slightly more difficult for us. So we would covet your prayers that the Lord will help us uh, to be able to do that and get everything ready for the 16th of August so that we will be able to meet once more physically and be able to worship him uh, together as a congregation. So we would covet your prayers, as I said. Before we come to the reading of God's word and the preaching of God's word this evening, if we can just bow our heads and pray. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, what a great and wonderful God you are. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be able to come and to praise and to worship you. Heavenly Father, so often we can take uh, these opportunities for granted. We can almost wander in, into your presence, pray and then wander back out. But Heavenly Father, we would just pray that you would just shows what exactly we're doing. We're coming into the presence of a thrice holy God and the only reason we can do that, we cannot do it by ourselves, the only reason we can come into your presence, come before you, is because of Christ and what he has done for us and what he's accomplished for us. Lord, we thank you for that this evening. And Lord, as we come into your presence, Lord, Lord, we pray that you will speak to us tonight. Heavenly Father, we, we, we've got so many things that are bombarding us each and every day, trying to get our attention, pulling us away from the things of God. But Lord, this evening, help us to focus upon you. Help us to focus upon your word. Heavenly Father, that by the end of this meeting, by the end of this broadcast, Lord, you will have spoken to us. Maybe you will have corrected us. But Heavenly Father, most of all, we would pray that we will be changed and be more like our Saviour, more like Christ. Heavenly Father, we pray for that. Lord, we are living in unusual times and we've heard this said so many times that we're living in unusual times. And we understand that, Lord. But yet, Lord, we know that there is one constant thing and that is you. You do not change. And Lord, you want to hear your prayers of your people. You want to, to hear them praise. You want to see your word read aloud. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us to do that. And help us to do that to glorify you. Not man, not denomination, but you and you alone. So Lord, be with us this evening. Speak to everybody who listens. 
through your word. And Heavenly Father, I would just pray for myself this evening. Help me. I'm but a man. A weak man. Oh, Heavenly Father, strengthen my words. Not for me, myself, but again to glorify you and to exalt our wonderful Saviour. And we ask these things in our Saviour's name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible with you this evening, again, if you can turn uh, to the Old Testament again this evening, and we're going to look at uh, the book of Jonah in the Minor Prophets. The book of Jonah in the Minor Prophets. And we're going to look at one particular verse, or sorry, one particular chapter, chapter 4 in the book of Jonah. And as we come to read, we'll take time to read all 11 verses of Jonah chapter 4. And this is linked in with this morning's message to a certain degree as well, a new beginning. And I just wanted to continue the theme today um, and continue on into this evening. And uh, we do pray that the Lord will use this word this evening. So Jonah chapter 4 and verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said? When I was yet in my country, that is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord, Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labour nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there were more than 120,000 persons who did not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. Amen. And we'll end our reading there at the end of the book of Jonah. I must admit when I, I come to the book of Jonah and I, I come to the end of reading Jonah, I'm a little bit disappointed. You know, because I think when we come to the end of it, we can almost say, is that it? Where's the rest of it? Surely that's not it finished. It seems to finish very abruptly there. But as we come to chapter four, the story has played out before us if you've read chapter one chapter two and chapter three and i'm sure you're most of these are all familiar with the book of jonah in chapter one we see the fleeing prophet he he's running from the presence of god he, he's trying to escape the task which god had commissioned him to do and that was to travel to nineveh that great city great in size but also great in sin he was to go to the inhabitants of the city and preach repentance to them but this reluctant prophet tried to flee from the Lord and tried to flee from his commission and he tried to flee to Tarshish. But God brought about a great storm. That leads us to chapter 2 and that's where we see the repentant prophet 
He's, he's faced with death. He's in the belly of this great fish, a fish that God had prepared so often, so often. We, in, in chapter 2, we focus on this fish, don't we? When really we should be focus, focusing on the point that the Lord appointed a great fish. But he's in the belly of this fish that God had prepared. And Jonah cries out to God for mercy. And, and God hears his cry from the depths and he saves him. And this scene is a wonderful picture, a wonderful word picture, for, picture of our merciful God. And a wonderful picture of redemption. How a sinner, no matter the sin, no matter the condition, no matter where he is, can cry out to God. And if they repent and they turn from their sin, they can be saved. Doesn't that give you great hope this morning? Doesn't it? It should do. Especially when we have our own family members who are wallowing in their own sin. And do not want to have anything to do with God. Then we see in chapter 3, we read of the, the preaching prophet. This is a prophet with a second chance. He's been recommissioned to go to Nineveh and he goes to Nineveh. And he does exactly what he was called to do. And that is to preach to the inhabitants and preach repentance. And we see how the wicked and evil inhabitants of Nineveh turn from that wickedness and from that sin. They repent and they turn to God. And here there is actually an action. Not just words. They didn't just say, we'll do this. They actually did it. They actually turned from their sin. In chapter 10 of, of chapter 3, sorry, in verse 10 of chapter 3, we see this. I read these words. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, there was an action. They actually turned from their evil ways. And God saw it. And when he saw it, he relented from the disaster which he said he would do to them. And he didn't do it. You know, saying you're going to repent and just keep on with your own life. You just keep on sinning and there's no change. There's no fruit to your faith. Then you, we doubt your salvation. There has to be fruit. C.H. Spurgeon said this and I quote, it's slightly longer than I would normally quote, but bear with me with this quote. This is C.H. Spurgeon. How many a hardened rebel on shipboard, when the timbers are strained and creaking, when the mast is broken and the ship is drifting before the gale, when the hungry waves are opening their mouths to swallow the ship alive, how many a hardened sailor has then bowed his knees in t with tears in his eyes and cried, I have sinned. But of what use and of what value was his confession? The repentance that was born in the storm dies in the calm. That repentance of his that was begotten amid the thunder and the lightning ceases as soon as all is hushed and quiet. The man who was a pious mariner, a pious sailor, when on board ship becomes the most wicked, wicked and abominable sailor when he places his foot on solid ground. There has to be fruit to your repentance. And that leads us on to chapter 4 this evening. The chapter that we've just read. And here we see Jonah as the angry prophet. There's anger here with Jonah. And we're going to look at three points. Jonah's displeasure. Jo uh, God's rebuke and God's mercy. So Jonah's displeasure, God's rebuke, but also God's mercy. The tension is building once more here. And once more it is between Jonah and God. When we read in chapter 2, we see that there's tension there as well. But it accumulates in a prayer, in a prayer where Jonah cries out to God for mercy. But this time, in chapter four, or chapter 4, this prayer takes the form of a complaint. And who's he complaining to? Is he complaining about the Ninevites? Is he, is he angry at them? Well, no. He's angry at God. And he didn't bottle up here. He didn't try and hide this. He made this plain. 
He wanted this heard. He was, he was angry at God for saving these Ninevites, for sparing this wicked race, this wicked people, for showing them mercy, for showing them compassion. Those who he thought did not deserve that. His fear all along seems to be that the justice that they deserved would be removed by divine mercy. And that's exactly what happens. But he says all this in the form of a prayer in chapter 4. And then, as I said, in this small book, there's two prayers that have been recorded. Chapter 2 and chapter 4. And what contrasts there are in those prayers. In chapter 2, he cries out for mercy. He wants God to show him mercy. He's in the belly of the fish. He knows he's done wrong. He knows he has sinned. He knows he's been disobedient. And again, as we mentioned this morning, another consequence of sin. This is why he finds himself in the belly of the fish. Because of his disobedience. And he knows he's in trouble here. He knows he's facing death. And he looks literally into the depths of hell itself. And he wants God to show him mercy and compassion. He pleads. He pleads with God for it. And graciously and mercifully, God shows it to Jonah. But here in chapter 4, in this prayer, he's angry. He's, he's, he's angry at God for showing mercy and compassion to Nineveh. Yes, it was okay for God to show him the mercy. But it was okay because he was one of God's chosen people. These Ninevites aren't. These, these are the enemies of God's people. They're, his God is not their God. His God doesn't belong to them. They don't deserve the mercy that he got. They don't deserve the compassion that he got. But you know, even Jonah knows. I would say even at this point, even if someone has rejected God. Turned their back on him. Cursed his name almost every day. God can and will show mercy and grace even to those people if they repent. If they repent and turn from their sin. And in verse 1 of chapter 4 it says that Jonah was exceedingly displeased. He was angry. He was angry at the Lord. And anger is a dangerous thing. We live in a, in a world that is just full of anger. From our, our shops to our factories to our homes. There just seems to be anger everywhere. And anger can lead to murder. You know, remember the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis. Anger can give Satan a place, an opportunity in your life. And when that happens, that will lead to evil actions. Psalm 37 says this. Refrain from anger. And forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. Another translation puts that verse this way. And this is very plain, very simple. We can't, we can't um, mistake what it's trying to say here. Stop being angry. Turn from your rage. Do not lose your temper. It only leads to harm. You know, showing your anger, being quick-tempered, is foolishness. And again, as I said, we see that in our streets today. The slightest thing, people turn in anger. And listen, when we are ruled by anger, we will be punished. The book of Amos in chapter 1 verse 11 says this. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity. And his anger tore perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. So I will send fire upon Teman, and it shall devour the strongholds of Bozrah. And we read on, even on the Sermon on the Mount, Christ himself says that anger is like murder. It's like murdering someone. It says, who is angry with his brother is, it will be liable to judgment. Now, of course, there are times, and listen to me, there are times when it's okay to be angry. 
we can be angry at sin. We can be angry at sin in our own lives, in the life of the church, or sin in the world. We can be angry at that. Christ himself was angry at the money changers in the temple. We read of that in, in the Gospels. And he was angry with the Pharisees because of their hardness of heart. But his anger, his anger had a pure motive. It had a right reason behind it and with a right result. It, the, the anger that Christ had wasn't control of him. His anger did not control him. And he did not sin because he could not sin because of that anger. And here we see Jonah is so angry that at, at what he has seen God do. In verse 3, it says this. Actually, look at with verse 3 with me. Actually, look at verse 2 as well. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you were gracious God, a merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Therefore, Lord, because you were all those things, because you were merciful, because you were slow to anger, because, because you're abounding in steadfast love, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. Well, you know, when I read that, I have to stop and just think and try and get my head around that. He is so angry, angry with God for being merciful, for being for for being abounding in steadfast love, for relenting from disaster. He's so angry at God for that. He says, take my life, kill me, Lord. And yet he's partaken in that mercy and grace before himself. But he doesn't want these people to either. He says, take my life. And this isn't the first time he said this. Remember in chapter 1, he told the sailors, throw me into the sea. I'd rather die than go and preach in Nineveh. I think that was in verse 12 of chapter 1. <clears throat> and again, I think we need to pause here and ask the question, why? Jonah, why? This is an extreme request. He is saying, just kill me. I believe scripture gives us two reasons why he says this. One, with the repentance of the city, Jonah himself probably is thinking at this point that his ministry to his own people, his ministry to the Jews, is probably finished now. Now remember, this isn't the first time that Jonah has been used by God. He's been used before. So he's had a, a prophetic ministry before, but he's now thinking it's probably finished. Just think, just think for a moment. If the preaching of Jonah resulted in no repentance, if the city was destroyed, then he would have come back to a hero's welcome, wouldn't he? It would have been a ticker tape parade almost. The Jews would have congregated in great numbers just to see him, just to listen to him, just to hear him preach. The man's, the man's preaching <coughs> who caused the destruction of the Jewish nation's enemy the annihilation of this wicked evil city wherever he went he would have been flocked by people just so they could hear him preach he would have been a national hero but that's not what happened his preaching resulted in Nineveh repenting they had escaped God's judgment how could anyone now accept Jonah or his preaching he would have been cast aside he thinks he's going to be cast aside because it was him that led to the repentance of Nineveh. There was an opportunity here to, to rid the world of this oppressive and cruel nation. They could have been gone. And all because of Jonah's preaching. And now he's thinking, no, that's all done. I'm finished. I'm no more a prophet. But I think there's another reason. And I think it is Jonah's misunderstanding of the, the, the width and the depth and the height of God's unbounding mercy and grace. It's a misunderstanding of that. And he's, he has a very limited view of God's redemption. He's limiting the grace of God. And he's not alone in this. 
Because I'm sure we have found ourselves doing the exact same thing many a time. But Jonah's heart here, Jonah's heart should have been filled with joy. It should have been filled and, and spilled and it should have been overflowing with joy. How a sovereign God had intervened and relented from disaster and saved this nation. This mighty revival in the city of Nineveh. He should have been overjoyed at this. But the whole focus was on himself. He was being selfish at this point. Excuse me. And there are many, many people in the church today who miss out, miss out um, the joy and the, the happiness that comes from being involved in God's work. Why? Well, because they're selfish, because they're self-centered. They've got a, a, a self-mindset. They think it's all about them. And we have echoes of that in the book of in the book of Kings. Remember Elijah as he ran from Jezebel and he, he's in the wilderness and he asks God to take his life. He says to God, am I the only one left? Am I, am I the only one, Lord? Just take my life if I am. And he falls asleep under a broom tree. And then the word of the Lord comes to him. Actually, we'll read that. <clears throat> 1 Kings 19. One Kings chapter 19, verse 9. <clears throat> so he's sleeping uh, under a broom tree. And I, I do believe there's great lessons we can learn from this this evening. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord. The God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left. I'm the only one Lord here. And they seek to take my life, to take it away. And he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. And the Lord was not in the wind. But after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Verse 12. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a sound of a low whisper. And what does he do when he hears, hears this voice? Verse 13. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak. He humbles himself. God speaks into his heart. You know, sometimes God doesn't use the spectacular. It's not always a fire storm. It's not always an earthquake. You know, Elijah at this point had seen many, many mighty signs before in his ministry. But here, God is using just a small voice, a still small voice. And he still uses that today. It goes on and gives him instructions. This still small voice goes on and gives him instructions. And these would, he would get rid of Baal worship. And he lets them know that he is not alone. He isn't alone. Verse 18 says, Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Elijah was not on his own. We need to learn sometimes that God is in control. When we think we are alone, when we assume that God isn't there or when we think that God has got it wrong. That he should have done it another way or when we question him. Why did you do it like that, Lord? Why did it happen like that? Why did you let it happen like that? We need to remember that his ways are not our ways. He is infinite. We are finite. He knows the beginning from the end. And again, this evening, that should fill us with a hope. A peace that passes all understanding. For whatever situation that we find ourselves in, we should be content because God is in control. Now, I, I know sometimes that is easier said than done. But we need to, this evening, grasp hold of that. He is in control. 
that leads us to our second point this evening. God's rebuke. God's rebuke. Now, rebukes can stay with you, and they can stay with you a long time. I want to give you two examples. I used to work for Stagecoach many, many moons ago. And many moons ago, I was in Glasgow with the bus, and we were getting the buses ready. I think we are going down <coughs> to Manchester, then on to, to, to London. And I was I had my shirt and my tie on, but I had a pair of jeans on. And the boss comes up to me, Mr. Souter, Brian, who's standing there in a t-shirt and a pair of jeans, and rebukes me for wearing jeans on stagecoach. I couldn't get my head around that because he's standing there doing work as well on the buses in his jeans and his t-shirt. And he rebukes me. And that stayed with me. Stayed with me all those years. I also remember the time when I was taking my driving test in Lisburn. And I had a tough driving instructor. And um, as we were doing the test itself, I made a few mistakes. And I knew I made a few mistakes. And as we were sitting back in the, the centre, he was going through, you know, the cards that they have and saying, what's this mean? And, you know, the highway code. And I thought to myself, I've failed. What's the point? And he, he shows me a picture. And I have no idea what that picture means, what that sign means. And I make something up. I just make it up. I don't know what it was. I can't remember now. But he goes through me. He, he rebukes me for doing that there. And literally for five minutes, he rebukes me for being silly and doing what I did. He then handed me a piece of paper and said I passed. But those rebukes stayed with me all that time. And here, look at verse 4. And it says this, And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Do you do well to be angry? What God is saying, is it right for you to be angry, Jonah? And God, so God's starting this rebuke with a question. And of course, of course, God knows the answer. We know he knows the answer. Just like he knew the answer with Adam in the garden. Where are you? He knew the answer. This wasn't a game of hide and seek. And Adam was winning because God couldn't see him. No, this was God's way of giving Adam a chance to confess where he was. And why he was trying to hide. It was a chance to repent. Repent of his sin. Or when he asked Cain, where is your brother? God knows where his brother is. And instead of confessing his sins, Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? That's a lie. He knew where he was. He knew what, he happened, what had happened. And so did God. But Cain would not confess it. And here God is asking Jonah, is it right, Jonah, that you're angry at what I have done? Angry at this new beginning that I have given these Ninevites. And of course, we can see that this anger that Jonah is displaying towards God isn't acceptable. It is not. But also what we do see here is that Jonah doesn't seem at this point to be angry at the wickedness of the Ninevites or the sin of the Ninevites. But rather, he's, he's actually angry that they, that they had repented. He was angry at their repentance. Instead of being overjoyed, as I said earlier on, at sinners repenting, he was allowing anger to devour and consume his very being. And listen, here's a point. At this particular point, Jonah could have got his wish. Jonah could have died here because God had punished other disobedient prophets before those who were in rebellion to God for similar acts God has taken them aside and killed them we can read of that in 1 Kings 13 but I don't think there's any doubt here that God is teaching Jonah a lesson that he is correcting his thinking with regards to the connection between justice and mercy justice and mercy and let me tell you I think sometimes we all could do with that lesson we could all do with that time is moving on and we'll finish with our final point God's mercy and we'll we'll conclude with this point this evening look at verse 5 with me Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city 
and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. At this point, he leaves Nineveh. He goes out of the city to watch to the east. And this is a point we can look overlook quite easily here. But I think it's put here for a reason. So that reader at the time when they were reading this back in, in biblical times, but also us today, we will see the significance of that. An eastward movement or moving east in scripture can and had symbolized mankind's departure from the will of God. We, I, we see examples of this in scripture. Adam and Eve, they were punished. They were expelled from the Garden of Eden to the east. Cain, again, what way did he go? He went away from the presence of the Lord and he went to the land of Nod which was to the east of Eden. And, and we have other examples, many other examples of this in the scriptures. Now there is debate as to why he, he sits there and he waits outside the city on the east. Does he hope that God will change his mind? And maybe change his mind and actually, you know what, I'll destroy this city because really they don't deserve the mercy and the grace that I'm showing them. Or was Jonah hoping or was he looking to see, did these people actually repent? Did they genuinely repent? Was there fruits after their repentance? And would it last more than 40 days? Or what I believe scripture teaches us here in, in the context here, that he's, he's waiting on an answer or a reason as to why God didn't destroy the city, but he actually saved the city. Why did, why did God show these people mercy and forgiveness? He was happy to be forgiven. I've said that all along. He was happy to be forgiven. He was happy to have the mercy and the forgiveness and the grace of God. But he certainly didn't want these people forgiven. And at this point we could say that Jonah is a bit like the unforgiving servant. The parable found in, in Matthew. This servant who was forgiven much forgiven all in fact the master of the servant went to the ledger and saw that the, that he had a debt a debt that he could not pay but instead of throwing him into prison that debt was forgiven him and that servant should have forgiven much also but he was unwilling to forgive little and Jonah's a bit like that here in chapter 4 and listen one day we will all be held to account Mankind has a debt that we cannot pay by ourselves. We are bankrupt. And this debt is huge. We cannot pay it. And it is a debt of sin. It started the day that we were born conceived. No amount of gold or silver can pay that debt. No amount of good works will pay our debt. No family member will be able to step in and pay our debt for us. One day we will stand before our king. We will face justice. We will have to give an account of what we have done. Will we be like the unforgiven servant? If you're saved, you know that your debt has been paid this evening. Christ paid it all on the cross. So we are able to stand before God with our debt of sin paid. Not by anything that we have done, but by what Christ did for us. Scripture tells us, and it's plain, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. Now, if you're not saved this evening, and you stand before God, and you will stand before God, whether you think you will or not, you will. You will have to stand before God. And if you're unsaved, and if you stand before him, your creator, and your debt of sin is unpaid. Then you will be cast. Not into a party. Not into a good time. But you will be cast into an eternal hell. And hell has no exits. You will not be able to get out when you're there. You will have no second chances. 
you'll be there for all eternity. As I said, Christ has paid that debt. But you need to turn from your sin. You need to ask for forgiveness and put off that old life and put on a new. So that Christ will take that heart of stone and give you that heart of flesh. And we cannot do that ourselves. Only Christ can. And there has to be fruits after that repentance. We cannot just go back to our own life and say, well, I've, I've asked for forgiveness and I can do whatever I want. No, there has to be fruits. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this. I know it's unusual for me to quote Martin Lloyd-Jones, but here he is. Do you deserve, do you think you deserve forgiveness? If you do, then you're not a Christian. Those, those are harsh words, but they're very true. Do you think you deserve forgiveness? If you do, if you think that, then you're not a Christian. Christ came into this world to be the sacrifice for sin. He was and is the only way by which our sins are forgiven us. Our sins are forgiven us through that work of Christ and by the merits of Christ. You know, and God must not only justify the ungodly, but <clears throat> he does that when he looks at us through the, the work of Christ. But he must remain just when he does that. The way of salvation must be constant with the character of God. He cannot deny himself. He cannot change himself. He is unchangeable. So the only way that we can be saved, only way we can be justified, only way a sinner, the ungodly person, can be justified is through the works of Christ and the merit of Christ. Nothing else will do. This evening, you can only be saved through the redemptive work of Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we again just give you thanks and praise for this evening. And once more, we thank you for your word. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for the lessons that we can learn from this prophet, the prophet Jonah. Lord, he was commissioned a task. He, he tried to flee. He could not flee. Heavenly Father, then he, he turned to you and, and asked for mercy, asked for forgiveness, and you were gracious. He then went and did what he was called to do. But even after that, Heavenly Father, he still struggled. He was still angry because he did not understand the depth and the width and the height of your mercy and your grace. Oh, Heavenly Father, teach us your mercy and your grace. We have seen it. We have partaken of it. Those who are saved, we, we know about it, Lord. But sometimes we try and box it in and we try and fence it off. But Lord, that grace is unlimited. Even the wicked of sinners, even those wicked inhabitants of Nineveh, if they repented, that they would be saved. Heavenly Father, and there may be people in our, our own families who we think are, are beyond being saved because of their wickedness of heart, their wicked of, of mouth. But Heavenly Father, you've shown us even in this book that no one is beyond your mercy. No one is beyond your grace. And we thank you for that, Lord. We've witnessed that this week. We thank you for that, Lord. So Lord, help us to continue to pray for those people. People who need a saviour. Those people who are in our families who are far from you. Help us to continue to pray and not to put limits on your grace and on your mercy. And we ask these things in our saviour's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Stay with us. Uh, we have another item of, of song, another item of worship. It was actually a song that we sung on our prayer meeting on Thursday evening, and it is Stand Up, uh, the blessed of the Lord, ye people of his choice. And again, we just pray that you will st stay with us, sing along, and that you will be blessed. And we do pray if you do go back to your own church in the next week or so, that again, that, that it will bring great joy, obviously, but also a great blessing to you as you meet together as a congregation and be able to meet and praise and worship your Lord. But thank you for joining with us over the lockdown uh, for so long. And we do pray that the Lord will bless you in this week that comes ahead. Thank you. <laughs>